Chapter 59 The Word Made Flesh The union of the divine with the human nature is one of the most precious and most mysterious truths of the plan of redemption. It is this of which Paul speaks when he says, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. This truth has been to many a cause of doubt and unbelief. When Christ came into the world, the Son of God and the Son of Man, he was not understood by the people of his time. Christ stooped to take upon himself human nature, that he might reach the fallen race and lift them up. But the minds of men had become darkened by sin, their faculties were benumbed and their perceptions dulled, so that they could not discern his divine character beneath the garb of humanity. This lack of appreciation on their part was an obstacle to the work which he desired to accomplish for them. And in order to give force to his teaching, he was often under the necessity of defining and defending his position. By referring to his mysterious and divine character, he sought to lead their minds into a train of thought which would be favorable to the transforming power of truth. Again, he used the things of nature with which they were familiar to illustrate divine truth. The soil of the heart was thus prepared to receive the good seed. He made his hearers feel that his interests were identified with theirs, that his heart beat in sympathy with them in their joys and griefs. At the same time, they saw in him the manifestation of power and excellence far above that possessed by their most honored rabbis. The teachings of Christ were marked with a simplicity, dignity, and power heretofore unknown to them, and their involuntary exclamation was, Never man spake like this man. The people listened to him gladly, but the priests and rulers, themselves false to their trust as guardians of the truth, hated Christ for the very grace revealed, which had drawn the multitudes away from them to follow the light of life. Through their influence, the Jewish nation, failing to discern his divine character, rejected the Redeemer. The union of the divine and the human manifest in Christ exists also in the Bible. The truths revealed are all given by inspiration of God, yet they are expressed in the words of men and are adapted to human needs. Thus it may be said of the book of God, as it was of Christ, that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And this fact, so far from being an argument against the Bible, should strengthen faith in it as the Word of God. Those who pronounce upon the inspiration of the Scriptures, accepting some portions as divine while they reject other parts as human, overlook the fact that Christ, the divine, partook of our human nature that he might reach humanity. In the work of God for man's redemption, divinity and humanity are combined. There are many passages of Scripture which skeptical critics have declared to be uninspired, but which, in their tender adaptation to the needs of men, are God's own messages of comfort to His trusting children. A beautiful illustration of this occurs in the history of the Apostle Peter. Peter was in prison, expecting to be brought forth next day to death. He was sleeping at night between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. Peter, suddenly awakening, was amazed at the brightness that flooded his dungeon, 
and the celestial beauty of the heavenly messenger. He understood not the scene, but he knew that he was free, and in his bewilderment and joy he would have gone forth from the prison unprotected from the cold night air. The angel of God, noting all the circumstances, said with tender care for the apostle's need, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. Peter mechanically obeyed. But so entranced was he with the revelation of the glory of heaven that he did not think to take his cloak. Then the angel bade him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. The apostle found himself in the streets of Jerusalem alone. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety. It was not a dream or a vision, but an actual occurrence, that the Lord hath sent his angel, and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. Skeptics may sneer at the thought that a glorious angel from heaven should give attention to a matter so commonplace as caring for these simple human needs and may question the inspiration of the narrative. But in the wisdom of God these things are recorded in sacred history for the benefit not of angels, but of men, that as they should be brought into trying positions, they might find comfort in the thought that heaven knows it all. Jesus declared to his disciples that not a sparrow falls to the ground without the notice of the heavenly Father and that if God can keep in mind the wants of all the little birds of the air, he will much more care for those who may become subjects of his kingdom, and through faith in him may be the heirs of immortality. Oh, if the human mind were only to comprehend, in such measure as the plan of redemption can be comprehended by finite minds, the work of Jesus in taking upon himself human nature, and what is to be accomplished for us by this marvelous condescension, the hearts of men would be melted with gratitude for God's great love, and in humility they would adore the divine wisdom that devised the mystery of grace.